This right here, huh? Okay. <laughs> There's Tim and Brenda. I haven't heard anybody. <laughs> Maybe we're not turned on. There's I Chris, huh? I think we are, but. Can anybody hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Is this You're not muted. That says, can you hear me? No. You better say I'm mute or something. Would it, you mean on the keyboard? No. Or on the screen? That's first, first thing I got my watch. Heard for a minute and then it went away. You're leading Bible study today? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Yeah, because that's what I didn't want to do. So I to go one. Island, we can hear you. I mean, I'm sure. Okay, good. I can hear you now. Yeah. So I need, you know. Now I can't. <laughs> it's like it the week before last where it was in and out and in and out. Go ahead. Well, afraid afraid doing doing um, maybe a little, little bit better, but he's still hurting a lot. Oh, sorry. Enjoy it. I mean, did you? Did you? I, I, I attempted to, to stick out my tongue and get a little blood oh, in my tongue. Oh, oh, I thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, I know. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> sorry. Whoa. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was trying to get a little bit more. I was trying to get a little bit more. I was trying to get a little bit more. I was trying to get a little bit more. I was trying to get a little bit more. I was trying to get a little bit more. I was trying to get a little bit more. I was trying to get a Thank you for your help. Louise, how are you doing? Um, what? Tuesday I go in and Morning. talk to the surgeon. Okay. No, because uh, staff for Las Vegas is two weeks. Okay, so well, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> so, as I know, I haven't had a stroke yet. Okay, so, that's, that's the important one.
And not have a stroke. Well, not to see how the GP well being dead, you, dead is okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we know where you're going. All right. Okay. Hey, Dad. Life is good. Dead is good. In between, that's so good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. So, um, yeah, I haven't had anything else go. Yeah, I did. My uh, the roof leaked, and so our ceiling is missing. Oh no. Oh, yep. Oh, That's oh. after they fixed the roof, and we had it redone. You know, all the drywall done. Well, that's all torn out now again. Oh darn. Yeah. Hi, Linda. Good to see you. Just can't see him. Okay. How how are you feeling, Steve? Oh yeah. Better. <laughs> He's been better. Yeah. yeah. He's been better. Is it getting better? No, not much. Oh. He's still really hurting. Really hurting. Well, they, they hurt a long time. We see a new doctor on Friday, so maybe he'll help us tomorrow. Yeah, because this has been weeks now. 21st, he fell. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a long time to be hurting. Yeah, you need anything? No, I think we're doing okay. Just, just prayer. It's the only thing we need. Yeah, okay. grace. You can think of something more. We're close by. You got to move this week, don't you? No, we close in the house this week, but we're letting the person stay in it until March fifth. Oh, I thought it was February something. Okay. And so, and then we're going to have some work done, like we got to replace the shower so that Jim can get into it, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so we'll have a little work done. So we probably won't move in until the end of March. Okay. We've got a guy that does good grab bars if you need them. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll find out. Jody's kind of helping us set this stuff up. So we'll find good. out. Yeah, she's got a lot of resource. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had three hours. Yeah. We um same thing. Secret. I don't know if he's still there or not. This is not going to be much fun, is it? Hmm. What are they doing? Just talking? They're talking, yeah, but I can't hear. We can't hear. I sent a text to Chris, but I don't think he's still there. And I sent one to Dave, but he didn't look. And I sent one to Brenda, but she probably doesn't either.
hit a clock. Yep. We can't hear you. Hello. We can't hear you. Online. Um, the hat lady, hat lady, uh, Shannon and Keith Mosley, Tim Wainemaker. Um, looks like the guy that talks all the time, not Vaughn, but the other guy, the neck brace. Yeah, yeah, we see if any of those could be. I've sent one to, um. It's copying everything I said now. I sent one to Vaughn, Tim Wanamaker, mm -hmm. Louise Davenport, um, Dave, and Brenda, and Chris. All the other people online can hear, I guess. Yes. Well, I don't want to sit here and look at this screen. Do you? No. I think they can hear us. I don't know. You're the only one we can hear. You can hear us? I can hear you. Oh, okay. I could hear you. <laughs> I can hear you. Hi. Uh, it's it's really the back. rooms. That's why I muted because, you know, this is a rowdy crowd. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you know what that rain that we got? Good news from our he sat yeah. there through that rain really trying to sell, and he said, I'm trying to feed my family. Yeah. Yeah. And here's this woman yeah. in a million plus house complaining yeah. because he's cluttering up her neighborhood. My husband went over and said, I want to apologize for this lady giving you such a bad time because she does not represent our, our neighborhood. And we're glad you're here. Now I want to buy all of your oranges. Good. Okay, well, let's get started, everybody. Welcome. And uh, can you hear me online okay? We can hear you, yes. Okay, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. You can probably hear everybody else too, huh? Hear a little chatter, but it's not bad. A little chatter. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. And when I was there, the they don't believe in our football. So they all called me Superfly. Okay, Superfly. We're getting started, buddy. <laughs> Superfly. <laughs> Okay, well, welcome everybody. We're going to get going on our Bible study today. We are uh, in the book of Acts, uh, the 19th chapter is where we uh, Ask, left off. Ask Linda if, she, if the sound is still coming in and out. She texted me. Uh, I think it's okay now. I think I can hear everybody now. <laughs> okay, see, you can ask her yourself. I will, I will let you know, Louise, if that happens again. Okay, there. thank you. Thank you. So, um, so hopefully everything is working well. Uh, and um, Acts chapter 19, let's begin with prayer, okay? Loving God, I thank you for the blessings of this day and to be able to be uh, with these people. What a joy it is to, to see each other, to hear each other, and to share uh, with one another. And we're grateful for this opportunity. We're also grateful for your word, for your presence with us, uh, and for a time to study and to learn. And we pray that we'll be ever aware of your presence and that through this time, uh, we'll grow in our faith. Bless us. Bless our loved ones. We continue to ask special blessings on Steve that he'll recover and his back will feel better. Um, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So at, um, just kind of a quick reminder, Acts starts with Jesus, the resurrected Jesus meeting with his disciples and giving them a job description. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, to the ends of the earth. Then he ascends to heaven. Right before he ascended, though, he said, but don't start yet. 
Wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you and to give you that power and the authority you need for fulfilling what I'm asking of you. And then he ascended to heaven. They waited 10 days to the, what we call the day of Pentecost, but also uh, Pentecost is a high holy day uh, for, uh, for, for Jews in Israel. Uh, well, Jews anywhere. Um, and uh, on that day, the Spirit came upon them, giving them power and authority, and they started their work. Their initial focus was all in Jerusalem, and the first converts to Christianity were Jews. It does tell us in Acts chapter 2 that there are people from all over the world who were there, but they were Jews from all over the world who were there because they had come to Jerusalem for the high holy day. Um, and so the first converts were, were Jews. Um, and and the, the movement really remained uh, um, a effort within Jerusalem among Jews until Paul or Saul arrived um, and decided to persecute uh, as a way of making a name for himself. Um, he oversaw the, the death of Stephen, and that resulted in Christianity spreading. Because uh, whenever there's resistance, the church always spreads and, and thrives. The resistance comes in the form of a persecution, the murder of Stephen. The Christians then scatter into Judea and beyond into Samaria up to Damascus. Um, uh, and the movement spreads, but still primarily Jewish. Right? And uh, um, we do get the story of the Ethiopian eunuch that enters in. But he'd gone to Jerusalem to worship. So, so whether he was Jewish or not, that was his inclinations at least. And so we have his conversion, and the, and, the, and the gospel starts to spread to other countries. But it's not until Acts chapter 10 when Peter, uh, who is the rock and whose preaching gave birth to the church, you know, well, the, Jesus and the Holy Spirit gave birth through his preaching, um, when Peter has that experience with Cornelius, and he realizes God loves all people. And it finally dawned on him something that had been the case ever since Abraham, since the first covenant. And that was that what God was doing was for all of the world. Um, and he realized God loves all people. And that cracked the door open for the gospel to be taken beyond Judaism to Gentiles. Um, short time after that, um, Paul, who you know, had converted on that road to Damascus, uh, and who then disappeared for about 13 years, was called forth by the Antioch church to help develop that congregation with the, he and Barnabas. And they did that for a year, and then the church decided to send them on a mission trip, and that's when Paul kicked open the door to the Gentile mission. It had been cracked open by Peter. Paul knocked it down and just went for it. Um, and took three different mission trips and had great success among both some Jews in every place he went and also lots of Gentiles in every place that he went. And the church began to grow and expand. And Jesus' job description to be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth was definitely underway. But because Christianity started as a movement within Judaism, it was always considered a sect of Judaism. Um, and within Christian Judea, within Christians who were Jews, then there grew up a group of folks who really believed that you had to follow the law of Moses to be a Christian. Uh, and that started causing tension when the mission trips were successful to the Gentiles. Well, it kind of came to a head in Acts chapter 15, when they had that first general conference of the church, and James, the brother of Jesus, oversaw it and ultimately made the decision, Peter's telling of his story of what happened with Cornelius in his home won the day, and it was decided Gentiles didn't have to be Jews to be Christians, that we're saved by grace, not by following the law. The law is a great guide for living our lives, but it's not what saves us. Grace saves us. So a decision was made, um, and the hope would have been that it was settled, but that sect who lost the debate didn't give up. It wasn't settled at all. They just continued on with uh, pressuring um, uh, um, other Jewish Christians, but also Gentile Christians to become Jews. 
Um, and it's about to come to a head again in a few chapters. Uh, and when it comes to a head again in a few chapters, it turns to violence. It gets really ugly, okay? But for right now, we're kind of still living in that tension a little bit. We've been following Paul through his three mission trips. And right now we're in his third mission trip. Um, and uh, his third mission trip is a long one because he spends two and a half years, maybe even three years total in Ephesus. Uh, that He stayed there longer than anywhere else. Prior to that, the longest he'd been anywhere was Corinth for a year and a half. So he's been, he'll spend a lot of time in Ephesus, uh, and it actually gets to a point where he spends so much time there that he gets concerned that he needs to get back home to report. He's been gone too long. They need to hear what's been going on. And so it almost feels like he abruptly ends the mission trip to get back to, to Jerusalem and to the Antioch church to give a report to what he's been doing. Um, and we'll feel that kind of tension as we, as we move forward today. Throughout all of this, of course, this story has been the story of the work of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes upon them. And from that point on, the Spirit is spoken of more, more than 100 times in the book of Acts. That's in 28 chapters, more than 100 times, almost four times per chapter, the Holy Spirit is spoken of. Uh, and we really get the sense in which what we're talking about is the acts of the Holy Spirit throughout all of this, who is equipping people, who's guiding people, who's helping to give birth to the church. Um, and as we get into chapters 18, 19, 20, um, we begin to have an opportunity to think more about the Holy Spirit and what separates the Holy Spirit from other forces or things that are at work in this world. Um, and so we're about ready to enter into a story where we see that it's very clear that the Holy Spirit is not magic. Is not magic at all. Okay, so that's where we pick up um, Acts chapter nineteen, verses uh, thirteen through twenty. Um, so, somebody want to read that for us? I will. Okay. We are in Ephesus, by the way, right now. We're in Ephesus. He's left Corinth. He went to Ephesus. He's been there for a while when we do this. So um, you, you want to go ahead? Go ahead. Yeah. I'll come back to you, Linda, next. Whenever. Some Jews were went, who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say... In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of, <laughs> here we go, of Sikba, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know. Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know about. But who are you? <laughs> then the man who had the evil spirit jumped, jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. How far, Dave? Um, through 20. Through 20. Thank you. When this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed how now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced Sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000. Oh, us, thank you. Through 20? Uh, through 20, yes. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Okay. What's a drachma? Was that the? It's like that. It's like a dollar. The, the currency. Of the time. Yeah, currency like of the time. Dollar. Yeah. So fifty thousand drachma is about five million dollars today. That's yeah. Huge. So Dude, I love the story. It's fun. Yeah, this is a hilarious story. I think. I started laughing because I already knew it was coming. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of a funny story, I think. I, I mean, he, he may have come out naked, and seven guys yeah. running down the street naked yeah. because some. I don't know you. <laughs> yep. 
Yep. Yeah. I I love that. I adjure you. I command you yes. by by the Jesus that Paul talks about. Yeah. To come out. They're like, who are you? I, I know Jesus. I know Paul, but really? Uh, I think it's pretty funny. Co questions, comments, thoughts? Any questions, comments, thoughts about this story? I got a couple questions, but let's hear yours first. In order, to, in order for them to make it across, shouldn't before they do an exorcism, isn't it? Shouldn't they have believed in what they were saying in order to get that done? Well, it might have had a little more success for them. Yeah, I mean, if you don't believe in everything, I mean, how can you do that? Yeah, you don't even believe. Yep. <laughs> yep. But there is definitely a differentiation that's taking place here because we've been talking about the whole power of the Holy Spirit. And right before this story, remember, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that when the handkerchiefs or aprons that had been touched, that touched his skin were brought to the sick, their diseases left them, evil spirits came out of them. Mm -hmm. So you got this, this story of the power of the Holy Spirit is so strong that just, just you know, a prayer shawl that, that, that Paul has touched um, brings some kind of blessings or healings to another person's life. Um, so, but lest we think it's magic, right? We've got these magicians, exorcists, who try to, to, to think that they can claim that power and do this thing on their own. And the Holy Spirit is not going to be associated with any of that kind of stuff at all, right? So the Holy Spirit wasn't associated with it, didn't help them at all, and they suffered the consequences uh, of that. But look, they weren't dead. Yeah, they're lucky they weren't dead. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And then and then it got people's attention. And now we learn that that Ephesus um, at the time of Jesus um, was kind of a hub for um, magicians and and for the selling of incantations Magicians. and that kind of stuff. Um, so people there believed in magic. Uh, and it was big business there. Um, the power of the Holy Spirit is a real force uh, that changes things in our lives in this world, but it, it's not magic. It is not superstition. And that's the stuff that folks in that community were used to practicing. So for instance, they would sell these incantations, these statements that, that could be posted. Um, you know, today we might put it on our dashboard of our car or on the mirror in our bathroom you know but they would post it or have it somewhere that you know if you hold your thumbs in just the right way and say these special words seven times something good's going to happen for you you know that kind of thing no, no. Mm. bloody mary don't do it <laughs> yeah and so so this was part of the culture of that day and, and when people began to realize oh what this thing is that's happening here through paul and his proclamation is very different from this other stuff and then they decided to get rid of the other stuff. Five million dollars worth of, of these spells, these incantations, these books, this stuff, all got taken out uh, and burned. Did that have anything to do with the seven guys running around naked old people? <laughs> when they saw that, that probably was pretty convicting. Right, right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> But it, it kind of strikes me as I listen to this, and I'm not so certain that that we don't, we don't still kind of hang on to our own superstitions oh, yeah. and our own That's incantations right. and the like. Step on a crack, break your mother's back. Yep, <laughs> yep. What are some of them that we hold on to besides that one? <laughs> hey, crack mirror, seven years of bad luck. That's a kid's thing, right? You know. Yeah. Walk under a ladder. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Throw salt over your shoulder after you spilled it. Mm -hmm. yep. Back in the, I think it was probably seventies, maybe early eighties. There was, I don't know who the mm -hmm. televangelist mm -hmm. was though, that he would pray over a cloth or something, and if you send him money, he would send that to you. He sent it to you. My grandmother fell for that big time and really? didn't heal her, but made her feel better, I guess. But mm -hmm. I, even at, at that time, I haven't seen that happen in a long time. But yeah, seventies and early eighties. Taking advantage that way, yeah. yeah. Doctor Feelgood. Yep. Yeah. 
so so we, we still have those kinds of things that float around culturally and and even within the lives of Christians, those things can kind of float around. Um, but the Holy Spirit is something very different from any of that, right? Because that's all superstition. You know, we're coming up on Super Bowl Sunday. I mean, the amount of superstition is going to be in that or everybody's in got front of everybody's TV. TV. Yeah. yeah. In 10 years. Yes. You know, and and <laughs> and and that stuff and that stuff doesn't really have power to change anything. No, it has power to make you see the world. So, but the Holy Spirit has power to change things for real, and that's a differentiation that we see happening now as we continue in here. At Acts. This is the real deal. It really changes people's lives, um, and we see then uh, that story of the handkerchiefs and people being healed. Um, and of course, it has nothing to do with the handkerchief. It has to do with the Holy Spirit, right? That's that's the change agent. And we're the tool. The Holy Spirit is the change agent. So, thoughts, comments? Yeah. Okay, go back to um, 12. Uh -huh. And it says that these things, aprons, handkerchiefs, and things, were healing people. Uh -huh. So that it was working. Uh -huh. yeah. But then... These seven are trying to do the same thing, and it doesn't work. Right. With the addition of Paul's name. Right, right. Because the seven who were doing it didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit with them. They weren't Christian. They were just take. They were just opportunists. So these in the before that on twelve, there are those handkerchiefs, aprons, things. That was through Paul. That was through Paul. Was through Paul. Mm -hmm. So Paul's yeah, so things. The, yeah. The These are Paul's the things. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit, it's like the Holy Spirit was so strong in him that it rubbed off on some things that was near him. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So now we have the same kind of practice in our church. Mm -hmm. The same practice. So we have prayer shawls. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And and what are the prayer shawls? Mm -hmm. You know, pe people make these things mm -hmm. and then... Uh, we pray over them and we and we bless them and we give them to people. And our belief is that the Spirit will do something that'll be comforting for the person who receives it, right? Whether whether it we you know we're not in control of what that's going to be. Mm -hmm. We just we just believe that the Holy Spirit's going to do something that'll be comforting for that person. And I remember when my father got it when he was going through um, uh, all the chemo treatments for multiple myeloma. He couldn't get comfortable. He's in such pain. He sit in his chair and he put the prayer shawl just over him to keep himself warm. And he didn't want to even move, you know, yeah. and that he found great comfort in, in that. The people making them are praying them, praying as they're making them. Yep. Yep. Yes. What's that? The power of prayer. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. You have a hundred napkins, blankets, whatever. That's the power of prayer in your belief. Mm -hmm. And I, I yep. truly think that with some people having a material thing helps them with that. Sure, sure. Yep, yep. And you add to it, you know, the power of prayer and our belief, and you add to that the work of the Holy Spirit, and miracles happen, right? So, yes. Well, in today's marketing, I guess you go, but you also have the 8% placebo effect. Mm -hmm. But if you believe, uh, you know, all these medicine and studies and this that and the other is a there's an eight percent placebo effect that if they send out all this this medicine and tell you it's going to do this for you mm -hmm. that eight percent the first eight percent is going to be a mental thing where people just believe it and something will happen mm -hmm. and so they have to kind of like write off that mm -hmm. and then go and then do the real test yeah and yeah the real test yeah interesting well other thoughts on this before we move on I, yeah go ahead Jeannie. Uh, I also think, I also think that, um, you know, we do have a special relationship with God that we should pray to God when we're alone. But the power of community prayer, you know, whether it's physical in church or you know, with all the tech that we have, texting, emails, um, there's just it's there's just a lot of power in group prayer as well. And Amen. I'd also say that we often pray about our circumstances and um, 
that that isn't always the important thing like our circumstances god will take care of of the future for us but anyway my point i think my main point is um her as a community amen amen well said thank you thank you cindy um one of the takeaways i have from this is that when you invoke the name of jesus or the holy spirit for personal gain uh -huh. it's never gonna work it's never gonna work, it's never gonna work. yeah 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 but that's why i think you, you mean it's not about me <laughs> <laughs> you know those and, football you know, players that, that are society today, you know with our televangelists some of them what are they doing it for they're invoking yeah. the name of the holy spirit and jesus for personal gain uh -huh. and you know it, it may look to us that it's working for them because it's material sure. and it's money and the riches of the earth but it's really not working yeah. Amen. Well, Thank several of them are in jail. <laughs> <laughs> are you put a few in there? I personally put them in there. <laughs> Charlie's got stories. I love it. Yeah, Liz. I believe that the Holy Spirit was with it, was working through me yesterday. So I was doing grocery shopping at Smith's. Mm -hmm. And I'm warning everybody, if you guys got to do grocery shopping, mm -hmm. it's really getting heavily trafficked. So do it today versus Friday or Saturday if you can. Uh -huh. Anyway, and I'm a regular at Smith's and you know, a lot of the clerks know me and everything. And I have tried, tried, tried with this one clerk and she and I just bounce off of each other. Um, every approach to kind of make, lift her day and it just doesn't work. <laughs> so I had I had too many items for self check, and there were two uh, lights open. So I walked down to her, and, and I people literally avoid her because of the uh -huh. her personality. Uh -huh. so, uh -huh. so, it's not about me. Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, and I've just chalked it up to you know some people you know you just can't communicate with. So anyway, so I get excited because there's no line down there on aisle five. And I kid you not, she takes one look at me. <laughs> and we made eye contact. And I could feel. Uh -huh. Oh, aisle 11's open. <laughs> now, aisle 11, and she could see that there were three carts on aisle 11, but she didn't care. And I cowered like the cowardly lion. And I shimmied down to aisle 11, but... Where the Holy Spirit was working, I believe. So we waited patiently. And my son Chris was with me at the day. And, and he gets along with this lady. And I says, you need to go ahead and talk to Louise because I've tried. <laughs> and he, he called me on it. He says, Mom, have you ever just tried to go ahead and stop trying and uh -huh. just listen uh -huh. to Louise? Uh -huh. He called me on it. Uh -huh. Anyway, so I'm at Isle of Love. And uh, the gentleman, nice clerk in line, um, he says, I want to go ahead and give you peace of mind because I had a couple of free items and two for ones and I want to make sure that they're run up. And he wanted to show it to me. And then I heard peace of mind. And I thought for a moment, I said, thank you so much. I said, peace of mind is so, so good. It gives you so much comfort. So I boldly, in there, with a lot of people, just pulled out John 14, 27. Uh -huh. And I read it. Uh -huh. And I was honored to do that yesterday. Amen. That's great. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I forced Chris to stay with me. I said, hey, you can work on your buddy down there with Louise, but you're standing right here with me. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for that. Yeah, Wesley. Question. Do you think that group parent, say a person is ill and family and friends come and they're in the hospital and they go there and pray with them. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a miracle that even that person, even though that person may appear to be so sick, they might be dying and then within a day or so, they begin to get better because of this group prayer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, in the book of James, we're instructed that when somebody's sick, you, you take, you take, you know, people from the church there to pray. And it doesn't say, you know, one of you go over there. It says, you know, take the elders of the church, take people over the church and pray for the person. 
um, because our ministry always takes place within community, right? And there is power in community prayer, you know? And that isn't to say this Holy Spirit isn't at work uh, in each of our own lives individually, it is. And there are times where that's our only option is to pray, you know, individually, right? But that, but that doesn't change that there's also great power when the community prays. Yeah. So I like to think of it as the spirits at work in my life and the spirits at work in your life and the spirits also at work in our lives, right? And, uh, and so we, know, we don't want to miss the our part because there's great power in that too. So last week we talked about, about the Holy Spirit quite a bit. And remember, I made that really bold statement um, that probably left some people scratching their heads. And that was my statement that I don't think, I don't think we can be alive if it weren't for the, the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. I don't think we'd be alive if the Spirit wasn't there. As I looked at um, Genesis chapter 2, how God breathed, and that word breath is the same as spirit, breathe life into us. It's just something the Spirit is always there that's always life-giving. This is actually going to come up again in another story in a few minutes. Okay. Regardless of our belief. Regardless of our belief. Yes. Yeah. Even Louise. Is that what her, was that her name? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Spirits at work there. There was talk that they were wanted to fire her. I don't know if it ever obviously it hasn't happened. Oh, no. I did hear you know the same lady. I see <laughs> oh, she's got a reputation. <laughs> Yeah. Are you being facetious? No, no. I heard some people talking. Really? Two, two sure. people talking, and I one of them came to work. And said, I, thought they were gonna fire her. I thought they were going to fire her, but I, that's all I know. Let's pick up for Louise. Interesting. Well, Louise needs some prayer. Louise needs some prayer. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> she needs some Jesus. <laughs> Let's all go down there to aisle number five. <laughs> <laughs> give her a give her a prayer shawl. Give her a prayer shawl. No, I've 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 surrendered her to Chris. Okay, <laughs> have Chris give her a prayer shawl. People been praying over this, and we want to give it to you as a gift. So, just saying. Okay, well, let's move on now. Let's move on now. So we we turn now to verses twenty one and twenty two, which it, which is a, a transitional section. Um, very brief transition. Uh, now, after these things had been accomplished, Paul resolved in the spirit to go through Macedonia and Acacia and then go to Jerusalem. So it's like, okay, I got to get home, right? I've been gone too long. I got to get home. He said, after I've gone there, I must also see Rome. So he's already planning his fourth trip. He got to get home. And then I want to get out and go to Rome. But before he goes, he sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia. Remember Macedonia, Philippi Church, Thessalonica. Um, so we got churches up there. He sent them up there to help out. And then it says he himself stayed a little longer in, in Asia. And, and that means in Ephesus. He stayed a little longer in Ephesus. So he decided, I got to get home. I'm going to send them up there. I'm going to stay just a little longer. Then I'm hitting the road. Okay, so that's the transition, and that brings us to the last story that takes place while he's in Ephesus. And after this story, uh, he does then decide it's time to leave. This is a long story. Linda, do you want to read a lot? Sure, I'll be glad to. Verses 23 through 41. All right. 41. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. <laughs> About that time, no little disturbance broke out concerning the way. A man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrine, shrines of Artemis, bought no little business to the artisans. These he gathered together with the workers of the same trade and said, Men, you know that we got our, get our trade from this business. You also see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost the whole of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and drawn away a considerable number of people by saying that the gods made with the hands are not gods. And there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into dis dis disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be scorned and she will be deprived of her majesty. 
That brought all Asia and the world to worship her. When they heard this, they were enraged and shouted, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with, the, with confusion and people rushed together to the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's travel companions. Paul what, wished to go to, into the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some officials of the province of Asia who were friendly to him sent him a message urging him not to venture into the theater. Meanwhile, some were shouting one thing, some another, and for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd gave instructions to Alexander, whom the Jews had pushed forward, and Alexander motioned for silence and tried to make a defense before the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours all of them shouted in unison, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! But when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Citizens of Ephesus, who is there that does not know that the city of Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the statue that fell from heaven? Since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. You have brought these men here who are neither temple robbers nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the artisans with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges there against one another. If there is anything further you want to know, it must be settled in the regular assembly. For we are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify the commotion. When he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. Great job, Linda. Thank you. You're welcome. Great story. Yeah. Uh, Reminds me a lot of what's happening in our country today. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I Getting people it, all riled up and shouting and not even knowing what they're shouting about. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there's a, a, I don't know what it is about some of the younger people, the Gen Zs and whoever they are younger than that. Yeah. They just want to get out and yell. Yeah. They, you know, they're told the story. And they have been programmed to believe all of it. And they really, they don't know the history. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the problem. History's not taught anymore. Right. So they just go out and yell and make fussy, fussy. No one will just make talk. No one do it. Well, so this is an interesting story. And uh, if you are going to summarize it in just a couple of words, what would you, how would you summarize it? I give you five words. Don't mess with my money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mess with my money, right? It's the second story in just a couple of chapters where we see that the love of money causes people to do hurtful things. One of them was the owners of the slave girl. When Paul healed her, um, she lost her power to tell the future. And they drug him out and beat him up and threw him in a dungeon and had him chained to a wall. Because And why? Because they lost income. Mm -hmm. And then we have, uh, we have uh, Demetrius, um, who represents the local Smith uh, Silver Workers Union. He's a spokesperson for the, the people who uh, uh, do this craft. Um, that can see that they're losing money because folks aren't buying the statues like they used to. And they're blaming Paul for that. And probably rightly so, right? Probably it is the proclamation of the gospel is changing why people would, you know, what people do and they wouldn't want to buy those. And then you just had this whole scene of $5 million worth of stuff taken out and, and burned. And I bet there was some, some, uh, Artemis statues in that whole pile of stuff that was getting burned. And all of a sudden, Demetrius and uh, these workers are getting concerned that their business is going to suffer. Lobby. Okay. So what do you notice in this story? What's the sacred stone that fell from the sky? So it's a statue. Statue of Artemis. And it was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. They didn't tear it down. Yeah. It's one of the seven it's wonders of the world. That is? Yes, it's still standing. Oh. Maybe some 
portion of it? I don't know. Yeah, well, part of it, right? It's yeah, that, part of it. was never whole anyway. In, in, yeah. But you got this statue, is one of the seven wonders of the world. Like, you know, people go to the Grand Canyon, one of the wonders of the world. And when they go, you, you buy souvenirs and you buy postcards and all that kind of stuff. Well, people would travel into Ephesus to go see one of the seven wonders of the world, the statue of Artemis. And the story was it fell out of the heavens. Oh, really? Right? And then, and then when you're there, you're going to spend some money. And you're going to take home your own little statuette uh, of it. So you can take a little piece of this back home with you. And so people are making lots of money off of it. And then Paul starts talking about the one true God. And folks get less interested in the statue. Problems. Should have sold postcards. Okay. And, <laughs> and like Marty said, they just believed, you know, this fictitious fell out of the sky without doing any homework as far as history. Where did that come mm -hmm. from? Yeah. Did, just believe it? did they yeah. have any evidence to back that up? Yeah. yeah. My guess is it unless it it was like a meteor, it probably didn't fall out of sky is my guess so um so um the artemis was also uh for the romans the god diane um uh for the romans diane was worshipped as the god of the hunt but in ephesus um um, um artemis was worshipped as a god of fertility uh, and the fertility wasn't only for human beings, but also for crops. And so the worship of Diane was directly tied to economy, to the economy of the area. Um, and, uh, and now you're messing with our, our economy, not just these statues, but, you know, Diane is the one who makes certain we got grain. You know, you're messing with the economy now. Um, and so word traveled and people got upset and they went to this theater and archaeologists have dug up the theater now and evidently it seats like 24,000 people. Yes, wow. It's a huge theater. And not to say that it was full of people. We, it doesn't tell us how big the crowd was there, but it wasn't like 25 people. I mean, you know, it was a huge crowd of people who showed up. And we got this great example of a mob mentality. Yeah. Right? All this confusion and shouting and it says, and a lot of them didn't even know why they were shouting, right? They just joined in, kind of like crucify him, crucify him, that mob mentality, okay? So other thoughts, or you, you see anything? And then I'm going to ask the hard questions. Well, it's, it's surprising there's no violence, you know? They seem to be well-behaved. I mean, they're mm -hmm. yelling and screaming, but well-behaved. And then they just disassemble. Yeah. There's yeah. not any hurrah. They just leave. Evidently, the clerk was respected, right? I guess. Yeah, because oh. he just said, shh, and they all got quiet, and then they listened to him, and they left. Yeah, no violence, although Paul was prohibited from going in, and and, and so the concern was if you go in, it's going to get violent. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Right? Um, they prohibited him from going in, and it didn't, and Paul never really experiences any violence while he's in Ephesus. When he does leave, it's not because of it, although I'm certain that there's a growing concern of what might happen. But yeah, there's no violence. It's interesting. Okay. And there's nobody supporting the, the church's view in there. It doesn't seem like it's right. all just the Gentiles disagreeing with each other. Yeah. 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 It's an interesting story. And I kind of wonder if that don't mess with our money thing still exists today. I was thinking the same thing about the gun lobby. You know, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe, huh? Maybe. Like the pat the pastor who was assigned to a, a, a church and noticed that uh after high school got let out, there would be a line of students at the local convenience store down in the corner. And he was curious about that and investigated and could see that they were purchasing al alcohol after school. Some of the kids were. Mm -hmm. And as he started inquiring, he found out that that was a place where kids could, underage kids could go and get away with buying alcohol. So he decided to do something about it. And he got, I don't know if it's like the United Women in Faith or who it was, but he got a group of people to try to do something about it, only to discover that the person who owned the convenience store was a member of the church and high standing. And the new pastor quickly became the former pastor. Yep. 
Oh, mm -hmm. why did we call the police? And in our conference, we have one church where there is a, a woman who's particularly wealthy. And what happens in that church always runs through her. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, money can still money can still influence. It can still speak, right? And is that church growing? No. Yeah. <laughs> See. Yep. Maybe she ought to lend him some money. It's not about money. It's not about that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, any other thoughts about this? I can't be the only one to think about this stuff. <laughs> but the influence of money on on decisions we make. Like, what if a pastor came to Las Vegas and said, you know what? we got to shut down gambling on the Strip because it is not right. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be running down the street naked, too. <laughs> <laughs> or concrete boots in the bottom of, of the lake. It would be a Methodist. wouldn't be a Methodist, huh? In our Methodist social principles, uh, the, there is a statement against uh, gambling. Well, that's, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Yep, there is a statement oh, against gambling. Okay. We are not supportive <laughs> of gambling. Um, although so it's not drinking. Um, that historically there was a statement about yes. drinking, but it's not in there now. But it's but yeah, that's been kind of lightened up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, um, and and in in practice, so is the gambling one, because our pensions are invested in the stock market. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, I mean that's a gamble. Right, that's a gamble. Right, there's good gambling and there's bad gambling, and a statement doesn't differentiate between oh, the two. Okay. There's gambling that that aids a community. There's gambling that that destroys a community. It doesn't di differentiate there. So, I think of the denominations that have split. Not only Methodists are divided, global Methodism and, and United Methodists, but uh, Episcopalian, several of them, and it. It comes down usually to money. Mm -hmm. Who does the land belong to? Who does the church belong to? And it just detracts from all of our message of who controls yeah. the annuity fund. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Who controls the annuity fund? Yeah. In, in fact, um, I heard the bishop in Africa uh, speak uh, about the pastors in his uh, conference in Africa, and there's a huge conference, lots and lots of Christians, lots of churches. And, and he was pointing out a few of his pastors who wanted to disaffiliate and become global Methodist, but were waiting until they retired so they could protect their pension before they did it. So yeah, kind of interesting. Money, money can color. And of course, money in itself isn't bad. It's what we do with it, right? It's what we do with it that can that can make a difference. So well, this is a great story about that. The greed and how we affect each other mm -hmm. due to the greed and yeah. the negativity that we yep. attach to each other because of the greed. Yeah. Also, David, it's like Las Vegas. I remember almost 25 years ago now, when I moved out here and I told friends back east that I was moving to Las Vegas, well, you gotta be broke all the time because you gamble. I don't gamble. Uh -huh. Now I shop, but I don't gamble. <laughs> <You shop. laughs> yep. But, yep. You know, and it's, I, this place is identified. It's not as bad today as it was back then. Uh -huh. It's just, just sad. And there's a lot of people that don't gamble. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, I was the same way when I was sent here in 1990. I'd never been to Las Vegas. All I knew about it was what you hear in the news. When I got a call saying I was going to be sent to Las Vegas, my first question is, is that in our conference? <laughs> then my second question was, are there churches there? I mean, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, so we can we can move on from this, but it's going to be an interesting juxtaposition that takes place here because we've heard two stories about, about money and greed, and yet we're going to be hearing about Paul collecting money. Right, um, and so we want to pay attention to the difference here between what people will do uh, uh, out of greed versus what people will do out of generosity. So there's an interesting juxtaposition that takes place there. Um, so we move forward now with Paul getting ready to leave town, um, and so uh, kind of another transitional one. Uh, 
this these next seven verses have lots of names. So I want to find out who wants to be bold and read verses one through seven for us. I will. All right, Jeannie. All right. I'm up for, I'm up for the challenge. All right. Go for it, Jeannie. So um, after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples. And after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Macedonia. Here goes. So Peter the Berean, son of Phyrus, accompanied him and of the Thessalonians. Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And in five days, we came to them at Troas where we stayed for seven days. Okay. <laughs> Thank All right. You. Thank you. Great job, Jeannie. Yay. Oh, thanks. Good job. Sounds like he's asking for travel expenses. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a, a a very interesting passage, even though it's kind of transitional, because we see he's now on his journey, and really he's trying to head back. When it says he wanted to get back to Syria, he's talking about his home church, Antioch. Okay. So he wants to go back, but he's heard there's a plot there. So he leaves Ephesus. He goes up to Macedonia, Philippi, Thessalonica where he had sent a couple of disciples earlier. Then he goes down to Greece, which is Corinth, to Corinth, to, to the church in Corinth. Spends three months there. He wants to sail home, but hears of a plot. So he goes back up to Thessalonica and to Philippi, and then um, um, starts heading around the, the, the sea that's right there, um, uh, and makes his way to Troas. And he's actually headed back down toward Ephesus now. Yeah. So you picture kind of a big old bay or sea, and you got Corinth on one side, and you got Ephesus on the other, and he's gone up to Philippi and to Thessalonica, he's over to Troas, he's kind of headed back down toward Ephesus before he sails home. We have a timeline that's taking place here as well, because we hear the Day of Unleavened Bread, what is that? What is that celebration? Passover. Passover. So the Passover he has, he's, he's a Jew. He celebrates the Passover um, in Troas. And then we hear five days here, seven days there. There's a timeline. And what we're about to find out is he wants to make it back to Jerusalem by Pentecost. Okay, So Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. So we have already heard 12 days now have passed as he's trying to get back to, um, to Jerusalem in time for Pentecost. And there is a good, good reason why he wants to be back at Pentecost. Okay, So anybody remember what the celebration of Pentecost is about? Holy Spirit. The giving of the Holy Spirit, right? When the Spirit came upon the disciples, giving them power and authority to give birth to the church and this new movement under the new covenant. Um, so we celebrate the presence of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost within Judaism was a celebration of the giving of the law to Moses. But in Christianity, it's the celebration of the giving of the Holy Spirit. So he wants to get back to Jerusalem in time for the celebration of the giving of the Holy Spirit. And now we can start to figure out why. So let me ask you a couple questions. He's telling us he's taking all these people with him on his trip. Why is he taking them? Who are these people and why is he taking them? Do you think they might be in um Gentiles who've who have converted uh you know others who have converted? So so these are leaders in the churches he has served. Given on the tour. 
I have a question. He's taken leaders from the churches he served back with him to Jerusalem. Uh, Dave? The celebration of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Linda. Um, my footnotes got me confused. It says that he he didn't leave Ephesus because he was frightened. He left um, for two reasons. He was in, convinced it was God's will. Mm -hmm. And he was taking a collection of money for Jerusalem and wanted to take it there. Where does it say anything about money in Jerusalem in that scripture? I don't understand why my footnote says that. Yeah. Um, well, your footnote's a little bit ahead of the story. <laughs> well, it says it's not. It says it's but, in verse one through three. So, but but he is going to be taking it back to. He is taking an offering back to Jerusalem, and we hear about this in other places in Scripture. So, for instance, in uh, in um, uh, in First Corinthians chapter 16. So the first letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth while he was in Ephesus. So it was during a three-year period of time. He wrote, now concerning the collection for the saints, that, yeah. means, that means the people back in Jerusalem, you should follow the directions I gave to the churches in Galatia. Okay, so Galatians being one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, on the first day of every week, each of you should put aside and save whatever extra you earn. First day of every week, what day is that? Sunday. 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 Sunday offering. Put away whatever extra from what you've earned so that the collections need not be taken when I come. And then when I arrive, I'll send any whom you approve with letters to take your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Okay. So he's taking a collection to go back to the home church in Jerusalem from all of the churches he started. Mm -hmm. And and we hear about it in his letter to the church in Corinth because they're dragging behind and taking the collection. And so he says, do what they did up at, at you know at the uh, uh in the Galatia church um and take an offering every Sunday, whatever's extra, let it pile up when I get there. You choose who's going to go with to take the, the, the money there so that that way they know he's not stealing the money, right? You're going to take, you're going to send one of your own to help present the gift. And now we know why it is that we have this contingency of people from all the different churches. They all are the ones who are selected to accompany Paul back to Jerusalem, each taking the offering from their churches. We hear about it again in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and even into chapter 9, where we hear Paul trying to encourage the uh, church in Corinth to contribute, to do the offering, because they weren't doing it. Um, and he held up uh, the church in Philippi as an example of not only giving, um, but giving beyond their means and giving with, you know, joyously and asking if they could even give more. Um, and so he kind of holds them up as an example as he continues to encourage the church in Corinth to participate in making this gift. So as he gets ready to head back to Jerusalem, he's rounding up the troops. He's going back to all the churches. He's getting the people who are going to accompany him. They're going to bring the offerings the churches have taken, and they're all headed back to Jerusalem, and he wants to arrive on Pentecost Sunday. Okay? So... Let's think about this for a minute now. So what does he hope that the offering will accomplish? Regular tithing. Regular tithing? Okay. It might be easy to say, well, there's a lot of Jews back there who don't like Gentiles. Maybe we'll buy them off, right? Except I don't think Paul has any of that kind of concern at all. But he is going to give a witness. He's going to give a witness that just as the the saints in Jerusalem gave sacrificially, so too are the Gentile Christians in all these other places giving sacrificially. And here's an example of it, is he offers it to them to use as they want. So it's a sign that the same thing that happened in Jerusalem is happening in all these other churches too. And then the second thing is, the celebration of the coming of the Holy Spirit, well, if you're going to celebrate the Holy Spirit, you're probably going to tell Holy Spirit stories. 
And he's bringing people from every church to tell their story. Here's my offering. Here's our story. All these Holy Spirit stories that can be told um, as a way to encourage the Jerusalem church uh, that this mission is accomplishing what it's supposed to accomplish. That makes sense? Thoughts, questions, comments, complaints, disagreements? I just have a couple comments. One is, um, did they all speak different languages? Like they're all from different different parts. Um, and the second is, this is kind of silly. Was it all in drachma, their, their offerings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, all part of the Roman Empire. So there was something that was common among them, even though they're different regions. And it probably was some common language as well. Um, and some common monetary system, I'm guessing. But I don't know for sure. I'm, that's just kind of my guess. I think the Roman Empire would kind of make it. Yeah, unify it a little bit that way. Yeah, yeah. We did notice in verse six, the word we shows up again. Right? So the last time we heard the contingency spoken of as we instead of they was when they were up near Philippi and Luke joined them. Well, Paul went back up there. And so Luke joined them again. And he stays with them until they start heading down south and they get a little too far from home. Luke doesn't like to venture very far from home. So he stays with them for a little while and then we go back to the day talk again because he doesn't continue on. Okay. So other thoughts or questions or comments about this? Um, Pastor Dave, is yeah. Pentecost where they were speaking in tongues? Yes, that was... Okay. Um, and it actually was the gift of hearing more than it was of speaking, because remember, um, the disciples went out and proclaimed the gospel, but each heard in their own language. It didn't say that the disciples all spoke lots of different languages. It says that each heard in their own language. So it's kind of that, that yeah, opening point. of the ears to be able to understand kind of miracle, it seems like to me. Um, yeah. Well... Having all of the group together, was that kind of pulling them to, to together to let them know they were connected? Or uh, that might not make much sense. But oh, yeah, kind of a connectional church there. Sure, sure. I would think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I feel yeah. like a belonging group. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. We're all in this together. We're all doing the best we can. And here's what we have. And yeah. Yeah. Group dynamics. Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me of today's NATO because. All of the the um, participants in the audience all have the little thing in their ear, which is a translator. Mm -hmm. and we had the technology today. What was done then? Yeah, and, interesting. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and and again, it's a it's it's a collective group mm -hmm. with a common with a common goal and a common cause. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting. How yeah, we, you know. Yeah, it is interesting. We, we've uh, invented stuff like that. Yeah. So so let me ask you a question. Um, if if we were invited to go to our annual conference, the gathering of representatives of all the churches in our area, Tim's one of our delegates, so he is invited uh, to go. But if we all were invited and then asked to address the conference and tell how we see God at work in our church, what stories would we want to tell? about how we see God at work in our church. Different kind of Christmas. Different kind of Christmas, okay? And that generosity of spirit. Giving out the food every Saturday or... Giving out the food every Saturday. Mm -hmm. the, ed Gross. the endowment that was started. And the endowment that was started? We're okay. helping young people get an education. Yeah, all this generosity. Yeah, Brent. We just heard today that we set a record for January in the food pantry. Oh, wow. The number of people served and really? the amount of food that went out and mm -hmm. 45,000 pounds of food that was donated. And I heard that the shelves are kind of bare. Yeah. So 45,000 pounds of food. <laughs> but I mean, we, we got a lot of food in and it's oh, gone. Yeah, no, that's true. It's yeah, gone. And the rest, oh no, they have the lots of oranges. Let me tell you. <laughs> 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 I'll read the spot on the giving page for the 
Mm -hmm. ah, interesting. To do something. Interesting. Okay. Okay. What was that? Yeah. On our Vanco, where you can contribute online, there isn't a uh, a box where you can click for the pantry. Okay. Oh. I'll check it out. Thank you. Yep. So lots of stories that we could tell, right? And and our growth, I'm thinking think our, our growth is our strongest testament to we're on the right track. Yeah, the growth. Yeah. And within the growth, the diversity. Yeah. Yes. You know, I mean, if I were going to tell a story that I might be tempted to make that the first one mm -hmm. is that, you know, th that a sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit here is is the incredible diversity of the congregation. So, you know, we've got people of different cultures and races and ethnicities and ages and I mean, across the board and and, and conservatives and liberals and all under one big tent and there and that doesn't happen in this world, uh, when especially not with a sense of unity. Right. And yet we have this sense of unity that is present here. And unity is, is a sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit. So that would be one of mine, is just this incredible uh, diversity. Uh, that's Pastor Dave. Yeah, Jeannie. A couple things. Uh, performing arts, mm -hmm. uh, the our music, and... Um, dancing and and you know musical expression and then of course art <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> with our, our art. art guild and um it's just been incredible all the participants and for this next exhibit we actually have fiber art so it's it's spreading it's inspirational it's god given talents that this church family has and wants to share because we all we love each other amen amen and a little commercial too uh we have our our second official art showing that starts this sunday so all of the art that was shown in our first showing has now been returned to uh, the artists and we have a whole new batch that's up um and um uh let's see I, I, uh, Shannon, I don't think, I don't know. Did you put anything in this time? She had a couple pieces in last time. I don't know if you did this time. She uh, did no. not. I did. Oh, what? Charlie did. Uh, yeah, and I will, we'll be there this afternoon mm -hmm. to pick up my pieces, but I didn't enter anything this time. So maybe next time you'll enter again. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and Jeannie yes. did. And uh, and my son Chris has a piece there, and I brought two of my father's pieces down, and so we got a lot of a lot of diversity and some new artists who are a part of it. So anyway, that's commercial. That's not really about the Bible allow, study. They're going to allow. They're going to allow uh, if they want to to sell them. You can you can purchase some of them. Well, my my dad's aren't for sale. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. I would include Thank you. the warmth and inclusiveness of our. Minister, uh, well, thank you. A big factor in that mm, Thank you. By the grace of God, there, huh? By the grace of God. I saw this hand go up somewhere over here. No, was it over here? Okay. The kindness and okay. caring that you receive when you come here. Amen. And that begins with you. Uh, mm -hmm. right. I, I think it begins with the Holy Spirit. I'm not wrong. <laughs> he works through me. Work, he works through yeah, it works works through me and, and especially through my wife. Yes. <laughs> and Dave, I think also that in this church there's a true sense of family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to expand on, on what Amen. Wesley's talking about. Amen. People really care about one another mm -hmm. and what happens. So so what with what Paul is doing, we could participate, right? I mean, we've taken these offerings as an act of generosity to make a difference in this world, and we have our stories we can tell of the ways we've experienced the Spirit at work in our lives. We could participate, and that's a and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Okay, so let's let's move on now um, to one of my favorite stories. Um, and this is verses. This is uh, this is a preacher's favorite story, uh, chapter twenty, verses seven through twelve. Somebody want to read that for us, Tim? You want to do that? Okay. 
On the first day of the week, when we met to break bread, Paul was holding a discussion with them. Since he intended to leave the next day, he continued speaking until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were meeting. A young man named Eutychus, who was sitting in the window, began to sink off into a deep sleep, while Paul talked still longer. Overcome by sleep, he fell to the ground three floors, three floors below and was picked up dead. Hmm. <laughs> but Paul went down and bending over him, took him in, in his arms and said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. Then Paul went upstairs, and after he had broken bread and eaten, he continued to converse with them until dawn. Then he left. Meanwhile, they had taken the boy away alive and were not a little and were not a little comforted. Which is a weird way of saying they were really comforted. <laughs> and a double negative. Comforted. Not a little. They were a lot. <laughs> okay. Great story. So, anybody here ever fallen asleep in church? <laughs> I, I, I can see you just... <laughs> <laughs> sitting still is difficult sitting still is difficult yeah it is difficult and when it's warm in there you know and the preacher goes on and on and on, and on. yep which is what Paul was doing <laughs> he just kept talking and talking and talking and the poor kid fell asleep sitting in the window yeah yep yep um I, and I do, I, I've told this story not too long ago, I don't think, but the, but when I was at university church and I was preaching, I was midway through my sermon and in the very front row on the aisle, very front row on the aisle of the church, a woman suddenly just fell out of the pews, <laughs> just fell out. And of course, everything stopped. I stopped, you know, everybody was concerned and, yeah. and a couple medical people went over to her yes. and they got her up and they took her out and they called an ambulance to come pick her up. And, you know, we stopped and we prayed and we wondered what was going on. And then word came back to us. She just fell asleep. <laughs> she fell out of the pew. <laughs> the Desert Spring, too, one year, uh, the guy sitting in the very front row. Yeah. So Linda is saying this happened at Desert Spring? It happened at our church, too. Um, Bill Godfrey was sitting in the front row and he fell asleep and fell in the aisle. Which <laughs> got his attention. Yeah. I got his attention. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep, we had somebody on Easter Sunday faint. Oh. Yeah, it was too full in there and it was just too warm, I think. And they stood up and fell over. So, yep. Well, this is this story is it's it's a fun story, and of course the boy comes out okay, so we can laugh at it. Um, but there's actually a couple of very important things that happen in this story. Okay, so when does this story take place? On, on Sunday, on Sunday, on the first day of the week when we met to break bread, and we now have a hint at um, the shift that's taking place from from Christians worshiping on the Sabbath um, on Saturdays to Christians making Sunday their day of worship, and it was all a part of differentiating themselves from Judaism, hmm. right? Um, and that differentiation um, was first theological, but then it actually started happening within practice itself as worship started moving from Sabbath, the last day of the week, to the first day of the week. Why would we worship on the first day of the week? Resurrection. Day of resurrection. Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week. So it's the day of resurrection. And if we keep that in mind, it's the day of resurrection. And there's a boy who drop who dies during worship, and he's brought back to life. Oh, right? Cool. It's a day of resurrection. This is what happens here. Um, and he was sleeping. Yeah. No. So we got <laughs> death breaks. So we got a story of death breaking into worship. Right? Death breaks into worship. But death doesn't belong there, right? It doesn't belong there because worship is a time of celebrating resurrection. So it doesn't belong there. 
So even in, in the church, when we're focusing on death, the proclamation is always resurrection. You think about a funeral service, for instance, where we're, where we're talking about somebody who's died. If I said, well, the person's dead, so that's done with, right? <laughs> that wouldn't be a Christian proclamation at all. Because that. we're not a, a faith about death. We're a faith about resurrection. So it always goes from death to resurrection. Um, and the movement in worship is always from death to resurrection uh, when we're having a funeral. Um, Easter Sunday, the movement is always from he was in the tomb to he's alive, from death to resurrection. Okay? And we see that just getting played out. First day of the week, it's Sunday. Death doesn't belong in church because our God is the God of life, of resurrection. Does that make sense, kind of? Okay. So if ever I get up and preach, you're going to die, get used to it, <laughs> and then go sit down, I have sleep. I have failed at my job, right? I failed at my job. You go to sleep and fall out the window, right? Right. Even on Ash Wednesday, right. when I make the smudge and I say, remember from dust you have come and to dust you shall return. Immediately after we say, you're going to die, we say, here, take communion, <laughs> right? We celebrate the sacrament of communion, which is a foretaste of the great banquet that awaits us. So it's always death to resurrection. Grant, were you going to say something? Oh, I just think we're, as Christians, we're all supposed to be living a resurrected life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to die to our own egos, mm -hmm. you know, die to self. And we're supposed to live a capital L life, mm -hmm. which is resurrected from. Yeah. So kind of that reminder of Paul's. Um, explanation of baptism, dying to an old so we can be raised to a new kind of life. Yeah, good. Pastor yeah. Dave. Yeah, Jeannie. Um, also, Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. And just as we've been crucified then with him, we are raised up with him. Amen. Great. So, so this is a story about worship. And what we hear happening here is the preacher goes on and on and on and on. And in fact, after he goes down and holds the boy and says, oh, now he's, he's alive now. He's good. What does he go back up and do? He starts talking some more. Mm -hmm. All the way to, I bet they closed the window at that point, but he starts talking some more and, and keeps going on. But why is worship important? Why is it important? You've got to be able to open up that dialogue, right? And so you just keep on praying mm -hmm. until God don't want to listen to you being telling you, you know, being truthful and mm -hmm. And, and sincere, mm -hmm. right? So if you can get a bunch of people to do that, they might be more likely to listen to you. All right. I mean, it's the gathering together. It's the gathering together. Yep. Yeah, it, demonstrates, it demonstrates to God our sincerity and our love for him, mm -hmm. but it also demonstrates to others mm -hmm. our sincerity and love for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Anybody else want to join in on this one? I think it also provides an avenue for um, professing your faith because I'm not one to be out there. I mean, that's just not my personality. And but it's it's real, real easy for me if somebody plans or whatever. I'm like, oh no, I you know I have church, and so it gives me, like I said, I you know for someone that's you know that's not real comfortable always doing that for me to say, Oh yeah, I, you know, I can't go then, you know, I have church or I have, you know, whatever. It just provides me that opportunity to kind of witness in a, in a different way, I guess, where no, I'm, you know, this is important to me. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to do something, whatever it's going to be after it can't be on this, you know, for whatever reason. So, but it opens that window. Yes. Yeah. That right. Window yes. When you tell them and right. they might 
Alice, go where you go. And, and that has happened. I mean, I've had so many, you know, where people, oh, where, where do you go? You know, uh -huh. and, you know, that type of thing. So, but just the fact that it's like, no, this time is, you can't touch this time. You yeah. know, I mean, that right there is, is kind of sending a message that this is a priority for me. You know, I'm just, you know, it's yeah. not going to happen. So I don't know. I dress up on Sunday to go to church and I walk my dogs at six o'clock. I'm already dressed already because I get up at five. On Sunday, every day, actually. But then when I'm walking dogs, there's other people walking their dogs, right? And they know who my dog is. They may not remember my name, but they know their names. <laughs> and, uh, but they know who I am, right? And they go, uh, why are you all dressed up? And they say, well, it's Sunday. Mm -hmm. And and they're dressed like a bum six days a week. <laughs> I think I can get a rest here, right? You know, I wear nicer clothes, right? And they say, well, hey. Good. And you're walking your dog, you're like, so what? Yeah, doesn't make no difference to me, right? It isn't like they're gonna poop on my leg, right? Mm -hmm. I broke Jacob, but that happened to pee on my leg. It didn't look on somebody else's leg. Well, so when they asked me, they said, "Oh yeah, well, what church you go to?" And yeah. I tell them, right? And I always put cards in and in a pocket of all my jackets. Because really? mm -hmm. you give them to me, I just shove them in there. They're, they're there to vote. Well, here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, if you, uh, if I remember, can I go to church with you? You mean ride in the same vehicle with me? And they said, "Well, yeah." And I said, "Yeah, sure, for sure." I'm driving a Buick, right? It is like I ain't got the seat, right? Mm -hmm. My wife won't ride with me, right? So I said, "Sure, whatever." <laughs> Whoever I can get into that passenger seat, right? I that's good to go. Buckle up. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Yeah. But so you know. Well, you see, when I come to church, I don't look like anything like I do during the week, right? You know. I think it's. Do you think about? Were you gonna say something, I, Yeah, mine. Mine's probably way too simple, but this is a, the question: Is why do we worship? Yeah, why is it important? Yeah. Why? Uh, be, because he's our God. Uh huh. Yeah. I, I mean that, and and I think that part of that is, and we're not. Uh -huh. If we don't worship, we don't worship him. I think we end up worshiping ourselves. Mm -hmm. Amen. I love that. And I want to add on to that that it's 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 kind of like moving toward embodying the great commandment, right? Loving God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. Well, this is this is our practicing some of that a little bit, you know, kind of working toward embodying that. But we but we do it corporately, right? So it's also that practice of embodying and loving your neighbor as yourself. So kind of that fulfillment a little bit, at least moving that way. Yeah. For me, it's a gathering of joy. It's 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 a joyful, it's a celebration. Um, the Holy Spirit is always with me. And I go around in life asking the Holy Spirit to help me this with this or whatever all the time and pray to God, etc. But when I come here and join with others, there is this this sense of joy and revelation in some ways because everybody is always mm -hmm. all of us are miracles in many ways. Amen. And it just it gives me strength. Yeah, I love that. And I walk away from church every Sunday feeling so renewed uh -huh. and so much stronger. Uh -huh. Excellent. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And I walk away from here feeling very blessed. Uh -huh. And so do we. Thank you. I was going to say, Thank you know you. what, just to, to piggyback off what you said, it's an affirmation uh, that I'm on the right track. Uh -huh. <laughs> That, that's what it does for me. It, it helps me to to confirm that I'm I'm going in the right direction. But also, I love the learning aspect too. Mm -hmm. So many times, I think to myself, "Is he a fly on the wall in my house?" Mm -hmm. Because it's so applicable. Mm -hmm. What you know, what I learn from the message. So I, I that's that's a real important part of it. For yeah. Me. Amen. So. In this story, we hear three things happening in worship. We hear preaching, we hear communion, and then we hear fellowship. Those three things. And we also hear that for the people who walked away, 
they experienced a miracle um, and that they were very comforted, right? So we hear some things that happen uh, in the context of it too, just in this itty bitty little story. You know, and I think about what, what happens in worship, what happens. And certainly, you know, preaching is one of the things that happens as is, you know, all of the music and uh, that, that happens. There's also um, um, uh, generosity that happens oh, sure. um, and prayer. Uh, there's, and there's encouragement that happens. Um, there is praising and giving thanks um, that happens. Uh, there's loving one another. There's a lot of things that happen in it. And one of the things that we often fail to, to remember when we're giving our litany of things that happen in it is how the Holy Spirit is at work through it all, right? And usually if we go home and we say, wow, I was comforted today, or I was encouraged today, or today we did church, right? <laughs> what we're really pointing at is the presence of the Holy Spirit that's been there uh, through it all. Uh, and I look back on this last Sunday um, at the 930 service with our Black, Black History Month celebration, <laughs> you know, and uh, oh, oh, my goodness, the spirit was present uh, in so many ways. Yeah. Can That's I tell great. you a little story about that? Yeah. One of my clocks was off. So I got here early. Yeah. I sat really early. Two services. <laughs> 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 I was definitely the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit got you up early for that one. <laughs> Amen. Holy Spirit made you do the Holy Spirit made you do the Holy Spirit. Amen. No doubt. Well, let's read verses 13 through 16, and then we're going to end for the day. Okay, so 13 through 16. Somebody want to read those for us? I will. Okay, go ahead, Cindy. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, where, Asos, where we are going to take Paul abroad, aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. When he met us at Asos, we took him abroad and aboard, excuse me, and went on to Middle East. The next day, we set sail from there and arrived at Kios. The day after that, we crossed over to Samos, and on the following day, arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. Okay, so now we could go back and do the math of the seven days and the five days and this day and this day and this day to figure out how much time has he got left to get back by Pentecost, um, but... That, that's not going to be real life-changing or transforming if we figure all that out. Um, but he does skip going to Ephesus. And that's interesting why he skips going to Ephesus. Because he spent more time there than anywhere. So why might he skip going to Ephesus? That's where he started. He was in Ephesus when he started there. He's, he was in Ephesus. He left there, started this route of picking up the people and the offerings and heading back. And then he gets to Ephesus and he decides to sail right on by it, right? And um, and maybe it's because of it hadn't been that long since the whole Demetrius thing. But more likely, if he stops in Ephesus, he ain't getting out of town too quick, mm -hmm. right? He's got too many relationships there. Mm -hmm. People are going to want to see him and he's not going to make it back by Pentecost. Mm -hmm. So he skips stopping there, but he can't leave town. He can't leave the area without saying goodbye to that church. And so the very next story is he, he invites some of the leaders uh, from Ephesus to meet him in a town 15 miles away. Uh, and there he says his goodbye to them. And that's where we'll pick up the story uh, next mm -hmm. time. Okay, so any last thoughts or comments before we close? Well, thank you all for being here. And uh, does anybody want to pray for us as we close? Do I have a volunteer for that? 
I love it. Nobody makes eye contact with me now. <laughs> Let's pray, okay? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the blessings of another day. I'm so grateful for these people. What a joy it is to be able to spend time together and to study your word. And just ask your blessings upon all of us as we go about the rest of this day, that we'll be aware of the presence of your spirit uh, within us at work and the way, it, way you work through us, and we'll be faithful. Um, I just give you thanks again for the joy of being together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you all. I love it. You know, she was a she was a principal of the elementary school in Princeton okay. in the 1960s. And I'll tell you what, that uh -oh. for, for a black woman to be the principal of a school in Princeton, New Jersey in the 60s. I know. She's remarkable. She's remarkable. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah, he is. And her husband was too. Great. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. Yep. 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 That's great. Good to see you all. We're good at 2.30? Yeah. Did, you, uh, did you want to? Yeah, well, yeah. Do you want to be here or for coffee? I don't care. I, I haven't had a chance to look today. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to meet the one we did before? Oh, yeah. I've got, I'm, I've got a lot more flexibility today than I've had actually in a while. So. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's been a crazy week. I'll, 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 I'll give you a five-minute snippet of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You doing all right? Take care. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. I've been the same way. Like, it's tired. Huh? Yeah. Well, you're working real hard. You know. He ain't as young as he used to be, buddy. <laughs> yeah. You said you dressed up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> see ya. You gonna walk with Jerry? Okay, have fun. Stay dry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see ya. Yeah, have fun. I know. But that's my motto. If you wanna keep moving, you gotta keep moving. Oh, okay. There's some truth in that, isn't it? It sounds so simple. It's hard for others, but that's yep. honestly well, true. Sounds so simple. Oh. <laughs> ah. Thank you. Yeah, are you doing well? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. Extremely busy with Are you? Um, my aging